welcome to the Unpruned Interview. My name is Sarah Brown and this is a series of Garden Organic Interviews where we let our interviewees chat at length on subjects that are close to their heart. Often the topic is too important or too riveting for us to press the edit button. In gardening terms you could say we're happy to leave their words unpruned. Our guest this month is Lucy Start, who is perhaps better known by her Instagram name, She Grows Veg. Lucy has over 47,000 followers who regularly see her pictures and are inspired by her growing adventures. She's recently become an ambassador on social media for Garden Organics Heritage Seed Library. I was interested to hear her refreshing views on gardening advice and where she challenges the orthodox gardening media. So Lucy, you're a top Instagrammer. <laughs> I don't know about that, but yes, I, uh, I have um, yeah, amassed a, a, a unexpected following, shall we say. <laughs> over this is the... fantastic. This is demystifying in some ways, or mystique around gardening, is that right? That's my plan. So I find, um, I hear from a lot of people all over the world, I get messages from people, and that, uh, people that are really interested in growing food. Uh, that they're really intimidated by just getting started. And I find that garden media in general is really aimed at an older kind of person. And I think it's quite intimidating for younger people, and especially people that wouldn't necessarily class themselves as gardeners as such, to get involved and get growing their own food. I think there is a huge demand for that kind of thing at the moment. I think uh, with, with people being more concerned with what they're eating and with ecological concerns about farming and things, I think, I think the, the number of people that want to grow food is, is huge. But I, I think a lot of people find that they don't really know how to start. It seems to be a lot of rules and, <laughs> and things that it you have to do. It can be daunting just opening up a gardening book. Absolutely. And, I, you know you're confronted with a whole load of Latin names and that in itself is, is, is hugely intimidating. And so my, I, 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 where I can avoid it, I don't use Latin names. I try and make my um, advice and my posts really fun and really accessible and just show that it's really not hard to, to grow food and that it, you can, it can be really enjoyable, it can be beautiful and uh, anyone can do it wherever, with whatever space they have, whether they have an outside space or not. Because that presumably is an issue for quite a few people, especially young people who are having problems maybe getting onto the property ladder and they're renting or don't have a large garden attached to wherever they live. They live in a flat like Chris in London. Absolutely. You know, these can all be barriers to finding space to grow, I guess. Absolutely. And there are so many solutions to the problem these days. And I don't know that it's necessarily covered enough. Growing in pots on windowsills and things or, or green walls. There's so many solutions. Um, anyone can do it, really. It's just finding what's right for you and uh, and having a go. <laughs> yeah, I get these messages from people and, and they're terrified. Like, what if, you know, I want to sow these seeds and I don't know what to do and... And I just say, just do it. What's the worst that can happen? They die. Sow them again. It's yes. it's fine. You've got nothing to lose. There, there's there's nothing. There's no reason not to have a go. <laughs> That's very true. And I think also when you look at the conventional gardening media, whether it's on television or whether it's in a book or whatever, you tend to see large allotments with things laid out in rows and people laying down rules as to where those rows should go and what should be in them. Whereas in truth, you can be much more creative. And in fact, the organic way tends to be more creative because you're mixing your planting. Oh, absolutely. And I'm a great one for breaking the rules. <laughs> I really <laughs> am. You, but you read in all the books about all the ways in which everything's supposed to be done. And I generally break the rules on most of those things. And to be honest, I have a relatively high success rate. Um, I, I think that people are way too strict and... And, and rigid about about how they approach it, and actually, I think I think there is a lot of fluid fluidity and flexibility in it. Just play around and see what works. Yeah, <laughs> you can. Yeah, I'm a little bit hesitant there. Because <laughs> though you can call them rules, I think sometimes what has been laid down it comes from years of wisdom and experience, which will prevent things going wrong. So you can prevent, for instance, mildew happening towards the end of the summer because you watered well. 
Absolutely. If you don't water well, your plants will dry out and they'll get the mildew. So though it sounds like a rule, actually it comes from experience. I think there is a huge wealth of experience. It's not about um, ignoring what the wealth of experience that there is out there. Um, and that's so easy to access. And especially through places like Instagram, you know, it's a massive community. Everyone exchanges hints and tips. Uh, it, it's a fantastic resource. So that is important. It, but I also think that there there can be a rigidity to things and an approach to things, the way things are laid out, that seems almost inaccessible. Um, and there are there are shortcuts and things. For example, I think like a lot of people are scared of growing dahlias because they think you have to dig them up every season. I don't dig up my dahlias. <laughs> I leave them in over winter and perhaps they're a month behind everyone else's. That, but I didn't have to store them lovingly, check them for mold all winter, repot them in spring, water the room to water them in the greenhouse. They just stay in my borders and they I mulch them and they're absolutely fine. And I suppose if you live further north, you may have problems with frost and daily. You may. And but even so, if you lose one, it is an, an it excuse is, to get a new one. It you? is indeed. <laughs> I'm fascinated by your Instagram following. How did you achieve quite so many followers? The last year has been a bit of a roller coaster. It's been um, amazing, really. I set up my account at the beginning of last year. And um, even in August of last year, I only had a 1,000 followers. And then all of a sudden it took off. And I think, I think a big part of it is just because of the approach that I take and that it's fun and playful and not serious. Mm. Um, and I also spend a lot of time sourcing um, specialist seeds and growing things that shouldn't theoretically grow in this country so I have a lot of tropicals in my flower beds and all my borders are fully edible though ornamental so it's just a re- showing a different approach but to edible gardening and um, yeah trying to make it a- accessible to a lot of people. Describe to me where you grow. Which I mean, part of the country are you in? I'm in Suffolk in East mm-hmm. Anglia so it's mild and very dry. Yes, yes. <laughs> very very dry. So I'm lucky um, it's a great growing area and I, I mean the thing about growing in the UK is you don't have to grow far to be in a completely different zone, growing zone. We have so many microclimates in this country you have to know your area. Um, but again they're, they're, you, you just talk to talk to people around you and you can soon find out how things grow do you have a garden or an allotment i have both i have a small garden but it's absolutely packed to the rafters <laughs> it's so totally full i managed to packing two greenhouses into a very small garden Fantastic. and i also have an allotment because i now i grow so many varieties i can't choose between varieties i find it very difficult to um, narrow them down which is how i've ended up being partnered with the heritage seed library yes i was going to come on to that <laughs> tell me about your work with the heritage seed library well i'm super excited to be asked be uh, the ambassador for the charity so um, it's a very natural fit because as I said I've taken a lot of time and care sourcing very uh, specific and unusual interesting varieties rather than growing off the shelf and the F1 things that other people grow I like things that either are kind of forgotten or or in, like from abroad or heirloom so um, it's a natural fit. So the plan is that I will be growing some of the varieties ahead of the releases of the catalogues so that people can see the varieties and see, become familiar with them before the catalogue's released. So that helps people identify what it's going to look like, that pea with the purple flower. Absolutely, the... absolutely. Well, I, you know, it's, it's, everyone looks forward to the release of the catalogue. I look forward to the release of the catalogue. Yeah, you go so leaping true. through and select your varieties. But, you, you, you know, you've only got the snippet of information that's there. And then um, I think when people have watched something grow from seed, so if I um, catalogue that on my account and people can watch watch things develop and see how they produce and see see what the harvest actually really looks like and become familiar with these varieties because that's the thing about growing the these old varieties that people aren't familiar with um they they don't know what to expect so much which is wonderful in a way because it's a it's a wonderful surprise (laughs) but also it's nice for people to kind of have an idea of of what they want to grow ahead of time so that's where i come in it's the beauty of instagram isn't it 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 is so that's where i come in so yeah i'm very very excited and it's just um something i can i'm really passionate about so yeah i'm very very excited to be working with you guys sounds like a super fit absolutely (laughs) i just want to go back to, I'm, I'm, while you're talking, I'm thinking about this. I'm guessing that a lot of gardening advice came from a time when people grew food as a source of self-sufficiency. 
whether it's post-war, fifties, mm-hmm. sixties, whatever, where people felt it was important to feed their families on what they grew. Hence the rows of onions, the rows of potatoes, the rows of carrots. If you're doing it, hey, try this, it's fun, but it doesn't matter if it doesn't work, you are in that slightly that milieu of, well, this is fun to do, but I can always nip round to the supermarket and top up with what hasn't worked. Do you see what I'm saying? There's l- I am, but I think that you can do that. And I think when people are just starting out, in order to give them the confidence, if you, if you gave them a patch of earth and said, right, you've got to produce all your food from that, then the pressure's really on. <laughs> so, and the reality is that even, you know, even the most practiced gardener has failures, you know? And um, so I think, I, I, I think the fact that you know you can back yourself up from the shops, um, as much as people may not be aiming to do that, can give people a kind of security blanket to really have a go. And I'd say nine times out of 10, it will work you know you will have much you'll have much more success than you will have failure but if you fear the failure and therefore not try in the first place then you've got you you're worse off than if you just if you had a go and, and got a bit of success yeah so i'm right. i am an advocate for just just having a go and and i think I, I mean that's how i learned i did yeah i read some books and things but really i just got excited about what i wanted to grow and stuck some seeds in the ground or some onion sets and and some things worked and some things didn't. And I think the wealth of knowledge that I now have about growing has come more from where something perhaps hasn't worked and I've been able to see for myself why, rather than reading in a book someone telling me why it may or may not work. I think when you learn from experience, you learn so much more and, um, and yeah, so... That's That's a very valid point. I remember Roger Federer saying, (laughs) I only learnt to be a good tennis player from losing. Yes, well, I think I do. I think you learn so much more from mistakes than you do from successes. Successes kind of give you the momentum to keep going, but failures will show you so much more about what to do next time. So presumably your Instagrams are also showing your failures? I do, I do. Oh, I actually lovely. have a highlight on my on my page called Fails. <laughs> <laughs> because I think there are a lot of accounts out there and they just like, show beautiful pictures of perfect vegetables and, and that's wonderful. But the reality is stuff dies. You know, I, I lost loads of garlic this year. It was a dreadful year for garlic and I've had epic rust and... You know, there are things that happen to all gardeners. And if we're going to be honest about it and um, people, you know, I have people all over the world follow me and come to me for advice now, which is unexpected, but this is the (laughs) position I found myself in. And I think it's important to show that you are just human and that you are, you know, that is the reality of gardening. It does not always work. And for it can be for something that's entirely out of your hands. And if you see that, the people that you follow and that you respect and you want to, you know, emulate their growing methods, that they also have the same problems. Um, I think, it again, it, it it's good for confidence. <laughs> when did you learn your gardening? Um, I didn't really. Ah. <laughs> I Yeah, that trial and error thing again. I, um, I've always enjoyed growing food so I was I used to have a completely different career I used to work in fashion <laughs> it was a completely different career uh, but well, even when I was a student I didn't have an outside space I grew herbs and and things in pots in the kitchen and I've always loved growing food and have done to whatever extent I could but just you know shoving a few tomato plants from the garden center whatever without much thought um and then at the beginning of last year, I just got really, really interested in unusual varieties and heirloom varieties and also um, forgotten crops. So things that, for, say, were very um, very popular with Victorians or um, Incas even, so ancient crops and things that have um, kind of fallen out of fashion. And I did um, quite a lot of research into that kind of thing. And I've also been really interested in um, edible ornamental plants. So um, I kind of have very little interest in anything you can't eat. <laughs> it's sad to say, but I'm not, an or- I'm not an ornamental gardener. Saying that, I have trained all year in um, garden design, but so that I can use it to create beautiful ornamental gardens that are fully edible. So all my borders, I ripped them all out at the end of last year, every single part of my garden got dug out, 
and um, redesigned and replanted. And now I have, even in the ornamental borders, I have several fully ornamental borders, but they every single plant provides a harvest of some pup, some description. And I think this is actually a trend that the seed and plant commercial firms are going Absolutely. down. Absolutely. Because they know that space is of a premium. So why not have a strawberry plant that's actually got a very beautiful flower? Absolutely. Which then turns into a strawberry that you can eat. Absolutely. And I think um, also there are a lot of things that are traditionally grown as ornamentals, such as dahlias. But dahlias were bought over as a root crop traditionally, but then they went um, down the ornamental flower route because obviously the flowers were so beautiful. Um, potatoes were actually bought over, I think, ornamentally originally <laughs> and runner beans were bought over in, uh, as an ornamental definitely yes. so you you realize how how beautiful some of the things that we just you grow in a kind of utilitarian way and actually with given a little thought and given something a little bit maybe a little bit more ornamental to climb you know you have a really beautiful plant there so um yeah how important is organic to you I try and be organic as much as possible. I don't use chemicals or, or anything. I think, um, for me, there are two types of organic gardening. Yeah. <laughs> so there's um, the strict organic gardening where you are buying organic seed and uh, like absolutely everything organic. And then I think there's um, what most gardeners aim to do, which is the chemical-free organic gardening, where maybe you don't, you're not buying organic seed and you're not buying organic compost. You're not strictly buying all the organic products, um, but you in your practices are organic. And that's what I aim to do. So yes, I'm chemical free and um, just try and try and promote a, a healthy organic environment in my garden. Because it's all part of the larger environment, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Lucy. It's been a delight talking to you. If you'd like to follow Lucy on Instagram, search for She Grows Veg. And if you'd like more information on the Heritage Seed Library and how to become a member, go to our website www.gardenorganic.org.uk or just tune into our October podcast.